All right, excellent. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, welcome to, to those of you who are joining us uh, by video. Uh, it's great to see so many folks here. Um, my name is Joseph Loker. I'm a professor of law here, and along with Daryl Miller, I am the faculty co-director of the Center for Firearms Law, which is co-sponsoring today's event with the Wilson Center for Science and Justice. Um, we are really happy to be working with the Wilson Center on this, and absolutely thrilled to have with us two fantastic experts uh, to talk through the thorny problem of um, policing gun violence. Uh, the way we're going to do the run of show uh, today is I'm going to briefly introduce them, then turn things over to each of them for some remarks, uh, and then we want to just open it up to uh, discussion. Uh, I have some questions which I can pose, but we really would love to hear from you, so uh, be thinking of questions um, and challenges that you would like to, you would like to pose. Um, I'll start the introductions here uh, to my immediate right with uh, Professor Phil Cook, who is Professor Emeritus of Public Policy and Economics here at Duke. We're also proud to claim him as a faculty affiliate of the Center for, uh, for Firearms Law. Uh, it would take me way too long, uh, we'd be here for the rest of the afternoon, if I was going to go through all of Phil's scholarly achievements and accomplishments in the now 50 years that he has spent teaching at Duke. Um, but you don't have to take my word for it that he is the leading voice on um, public policy and economics approaches to gun violence. That is uh, a fact ratified by Phil's uh, recent uh, awarding of the reception of the Stockholm Prize, which is basically the Nobel Prize for Criminology, uh, which Phil uh, received just a few years ago. He is, I think, the most significant voice who's been pioneering and writing on this issue um, uh, uh, for decades. Of particular relevance to today's topic, he just published um, yet another book, um, Policing Gun Violence, uh, and we'll be able to talk through some of the themes uh, of that today. We're also incredibly lucky to have with us um, the chief of the Durham Police Department, Patrice Andrews. Um, uh, uh, chief Andrews began her career with the Durham Police Department back in 1997. Uh, as, uh, uh, as a patrol officer, then advanced to district commander and to captain before leaving us uh, to go up the road to Morrisville, where she was the chief of police uh, until returning to Durham in 2021, um, which is a significant year in so many ways, uh, especially, uh, or including, I would say, for uh, gun violence and for homicide. Um, I was reminded this morning, the very first line of Phil's book is, 2020 was the year from hell. Uh, and actually, 2021 eclipsed it uh, with regard to gun violence and gun homicides in Durham. That was the beginning. The Chief Andrews took over at the end of that year. Um, but uh, that year saw the highest, I think, ever recorded number of gun homicides in Durham. Um, so this has been a priority of her tenure, including bringing some really innovative approaches, like restorative justice approaches, to thinking about questions of gun violence. Um, it's wonderful, too, that um, Professor Cook and Chief Andrews know each other's work and have collaborated and discussed these things over the years, so we should have a really wonderful um, set of perspectives here. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Professor Cook um, for some remarks, and then, again, please be thinking of your questions for the Q&A. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, and thank you very much, Joseph. I am particularly delighted not only to be here, but to be joined by Chief Andrews. Uh, and uh, I guess my real job here is not to occupy the podium very long so I can just get out of the way and listen to what she has to say about what's actually happening out there. But let me, let me just talk about the book and start um, by talking about my personal background uh, doing the kind of work that Joseph was referring to. Uh, I did uh, get started on gun violence prevention research in the 1970s, and that was a natural outgrowth of my interest in the economics of crime. Uh, it turns out that most gun violence is criminal, uh, and that that was uh, then a, a natural transition along the way. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we look at the most recent data, what we find is in 2021, that about 21,000 people were murdered with guns. Uh, and during that same time, there were 
about 100,000 people who were shot and injured uh, in criminal circumstances. Uh, so that it's fair to say then uh, that even though, of course, guns are also very important in suicide, that the great bulk uh, of gun violence is criminal. And uh, these days, for homicide in particular, over 80% of all of the homicides are committed with guns. It's an all-time record, and it continues to climb along the way. Uh, so the intersection of, of my interest in crime and interest in gun violence, the cost of gun violence is by no means limited to the immediate victims. Uh, and the obvious thing here is that people who live in neighborhoods that are heavily impacted by gun violence live in fear very often. But others will talk about how they get their kids in off the street at 4 o'clock, and they have them sometimes, in extreme cases, sleeping in the bathtub for fear of a stray bullet coming through the window. And that they adapt their activities in a variety of ways uh, with an eye to trying to stay safe. Uh, and of course, this is not good for the blood pressure. Uh, recent research is documenting the effect on children growing up in highly impacted neighborhoods, uh, documenting particularly the trauma that they often experience, which has tangible consequences for high rates of truancy and, and uh, underperformance in school and many other things. Uh, not to mention that those are areas that people who uh, can avoid when it comes to deciding where to live. Uh, and property values are bound to suffer as a result. It's, uh, gun violence is a, a urban development nightmare. Uh, and so if we put all this uh, together, uh, I think it is fair to say, and look at the chief and when I do this, the gun violence is our most costly and highest priority crime. And that's true in Durham. I think it's true in many cities that are faced with this problem. Uh, of course, gun violence is not uniformly distributed. Uh, and in fact, the disparity by race, by sex, by age, are as large as any that we see in the health literature. We think of this as a, a health problem. Uh, that in fact, the homicide victimization rate um, is 10 times as high for uh, African American people as it is for white people. Uh, if we leave Hispanics out of that equation, it's 14 times as high. So this is not rounding error. This, this, this is huge. And in fact, even though uh, African Americans are perhaps 13% uh, of the US population, they account for 62% of all of the victimization from homicide. Uh, add to that the further concentration, as I say, by sex and, and and that it's concentrated among younger uh, uh, men in particular. And the problem begins to emerge. And of course, it has its counterpart in geography. It, it means that low income, predominantly African American neighborhoods, uh, bear the brunt uh, of routine or day to day gun violence. So if we step back from this, we see that gun violence then is a crime problem. It's, certainly a public health problem. It's an economic development problem. It, it's a problem for our standard of living. Uh, and it's a problem of social justice. And for all of those reasons, uh, this is not just to defend why I've spent so many years <laughs> working on it, but to, to say that this has been um, a, a very compelling issue. So. The focus on the police is something new for me. 
And in fact, most of the work that I've done over the years has been concerned on other topics that are related to gun violence prevention, and particularly, for example, the question of availability of guns and the efforts to separate guns from the hands of dangerous, dangerous people. Uh, so studying the prevalence of guns, what difference that makes, uh, the workings of the underground economy in guns, for example, and certainly looking at regulation. Uh, and the regulations in the US uh, are uh, notably weak by international standards, but nonetheless, there is a lot of evidence that some of them are quite important in, in reducing the problem of gun violence and, and uh, have, have the kinds of effects that we would hope, at, at least in the right direction. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we live in an era of deregulation of guns, uh, and uh, that can be encapsulated by my own experience coming to Durham in 1973. At that time, it was essentially illegal for anybody to carry a gun concealed in the state of North Carolina, period. Uh, and we had a robust pistol permit law that had been in effect since the 1920s. Uh, and continued to operate so that if you wanted to buy a handgun, you had to get a permit from the sheriff along the way. Well, it wasn't too many years after that that the prohibition of carrying was repealed and replaced with a permissive licensing system. Uh, at the same time, that many other states were going much farther than that, and, and now half the states have completely deregulated carrying uh, and concealed or anything else. Um, and we just had our General Assembly vote to repeal this 100-year-old pistol permit law. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. But it's not a happy story. In the face of um, this kind of discouraging trajectory, I ended up um, deciding that uh, perhaps uh, it was time to shift my focus to something where I had... Uh, had, had more promise uh, and got interested in, in the issue of what can the police do to be effective in, in this area and to fill in where deregulation has created a gap. Uh, one thing that if you follow this, uh, this discussion in, in the, the, the uh, about what, what should we do about gun violence? Uh, the progressive voices out there, starting with Nicholas Kristof of, of the New York Times, but many others, uh, who have embraced the mantra that uh, gun violence is a public health problem, uh, mean by that that uh, they're really not going to pay any attention at all to the police, except perhaps to sneer at them or, or to point out that they're not perfect. And that has created this kind of vacuum in the well-meaning, systematic attention to what do we do in, in this area um, to uh, make, make the police more effective partners in, in this. Uh, so I want to talk about that and, and what the book has to say uh, about that. But let me uh, start with just two qualifiers. Um, the first thing is that, of course, Anthony Braga and I understand very well that gun violence is a multifaceted problem, that it lends itself to a variety of approaches, and that, in fact, that we can't offer policing and more effective policing as an alternative, but rather as a supplement or a complement to education, improved education, an area I've done some work, certainly investments in child development, um, housing the homeless, even cleaning up vacant lots where there's a good deal of evidence in that right now, uh, offering summer jobs to kids at risk and so on and so forth. But all of those, I say, amen, let's do it. But they don't offer any kind of alternative to effective policing even though they are important. Uh, 
We still need the police to hold shooters accountable, to quiet hot spots, to enforce whatever gun regulations we have on the books. And so forth. The other thing that I will acknowledge at, at this point is that the police are an imperfect institution. Um, and that, uh, that, of course, receives constant attention these days for a variety of reasons, and, and particularly because of very extreme and, and disturbing uh, scenes that we've seen videotaped. Um, and all I would say about that is they're imperfect but essential, uh, like so many other institutions that we have, and so that, uh, you know, it might even apply to universities, for goodness sake. Uh, certainly, uh, medical care, nursing homes, I mean, you, you name your, your favorite institution and you will quickly come to mind that there is not operating perfectly. Uh, and the response to that is not, let's do away with it, the response is, let's reform it. And that's I think the goal in part of this book. Okay. So, Frog and I offer strategic thinking based on the evidence. Um, we're looking for what works, uh, but also what's worthwhile. Uh, and I think both of those are important that some things that work uh, are not worthwhile because they're too costly. We need restraint, we need balance. Uh, and in fact, in, in ethnographic work, um, residents of high violence areas, uh, particularly minority uh, residents, often say that they feel both over policed and under policed, in, in some version of that. Uh, and both of those are relevant. On the over policing side, we have an example in the book that we talk about, which is the story of the advent of stop, question, and frisk. Uh, and I, that was, uh, I don't know whether it started in New York, but it certainly had its heyday in New York City. Uh, and they uh, adopted um, a, a strategy for the best of motives, which was to reduce gun carrying in public and thereby reduce gun violence. Uh, obviously a goal I endorse. Um, but they way overdid it. And at the peak, there were 700,000 unpleasant encounters in a single year. Uh, and of course, those were further concentrated um, in uh, often in those neighborhoods that, that did have higher rates of violence. Uh, and so that it was um, making lives miserable for young black men, for example, who were often stopped routinely for no particular reason. The, the, the upshot, uh, as you probably know, was uh, there were lawsuits uh, in, in New York and, and the other big cities that had taken this on. Uh, in New York in 2013, the, the ruling was that the, there was a pattern in practice that was deemed unconstitutional um, with the Fourth Amendment uh, violations, and, and it was also unjustly discriminatory. Uh, the police department did away with it and says that what they do now is called precision policing uh, and certainly a much lower volume. Okay, so the point is that you can overdo it, that over policing is a feature that is to be avoided. On the under policing side, that the, the example that I want to stress is the very low clearance rates in shooting cases. Uh, I had the the chance, thanks to the chief, to do a study of five years of investigations in Durham, uh, and it ended up that um, the chance that a shooting in Durham during that period would result in an arrest and a conviction was about one in seven. Uh, so that um, means that if you're a, a kid deciding whether to join a, a group that's going to do a ride along um, or a, 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 do a drive-by shooting, that you don't have to worry too much that you'll end up in prison as a result of that. And you know the, the effect of this, which is not by any means unique to Durham, but is found in the other cities I've looked at, in, in Durham, in Chicago, uh, 
for example, in St. Louis, um, in Baltimore, and, and uh, a number of other country, uh, cities that there's these very low rates, um, <coughs> of, of, especially for the case of non-fatal shootings in, in one way. Um, and so the victims in, uh, that, and, and the community that suffers the brunt of the violence is, is often concludes that the police are indifferent to their interests. I mean, they can see the shooters walking around in their neighborhood free, uh, that there is no justice being done for them, let alone the, the kind of consequence that, that you'd expect from a prison term of deterrence and incapacitation and so forth. The cycle of violence continues. And so that um, that constitutes under-policing in my book, uh, and uh, the strategy that I've been advocating for a number of years now is to at least upgrade the investigations of non-fatal shootings and so that they have something like the same priority as fatal shootings. Uh, right now in most cities, there is a big gap between the two, which is reflected in, in the uh, clearance rates. And sure enough, uh, I had a chance in 2017 to interview investigators in Durham, and I asked them, you know, why is your arrest rate so much higher for fatal shootings and non-fatal shootings when those two types of crime differ only by chance, is what it amounts to. In fact, there's a term for this which is almost science that has been coined that reflects this idea that, that um, whether the victim lives or dies, it's very often just a matter of millimeters about where the bullet goes and it doesn't um, change the circumstances, the motivation, who's involved on it one way or another. And so in every sense, for prevention purposes, it seems like these are as high priority. What we want to do is to stop shootings, not particularly to stop fatal shootings. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, so um, when I ask the Investigators in Durham, how do you account for this big gap? Their first answer was, well, these homicide guys, they have a light caseload. And, you know, we, those of us who are investigating the aggravated assaults, we're dealing with scores of cases, but the homicide guys, you know, they only have a couple. And uh, that, that is a large, largely what accounts for it. Now, there, there was a second reason, too, uh, which I think is also significant, and that is that um, the investigations of non-fatal shootings have a problem uh, that the <clears throat> investigations of fatal shootings don't, and that is the victim. The, the victim, rather than being an ally in these investigations, is often an obstacle. Uh, and if the victim is not willing to cooperate, it's usually uh, fruitless to continue the investigation because the district attorney won't take the case. So that's a, a, another feature of it. But the resources matter in this, in, in their view. Uh, at Chief Andrews' request, I had a chance to look at five years of data to replicate the uh, study I've done in Boston uh, with, with uh, Anthony Braga. And uh, what we found, sure enough, was that in the non-fatal shootings, uh, there was um, less evidence of every type collected. Uh, and so that, that it was clear from that that the part of the explanation for why the, 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 the arrest rate for the fatal shootings was three times as high was simply that there was a lot more effort and capacity being devoted to it. OK. Um, my understanding? Uh, and perhaps she'll talk about this, that, that uh, Chief Andrews has been interested in this argument from the beginning, and um, that she may say something about the reforms that she herself has instituted. I see other cities are beginning to adopt it, most notably Denver in, 19, in 2020, and uh, Philadelphia made a gesture recently in some other cities. But it, it's, it's going in the right direction, I think. Uh, let me conclude just by quoting uh, my uh, favorite author uh, in this area, the 
journalist, uh, Jill Leobi, who wrote uh, really an amazing book uh, called Ghetto Side. Uh, and she says, uh, where the criminal justice system fails to respond vigorously to violent injury and death, homicide becomes endemic. African Americans have suffered from just such a lack of effective criminal justice. And she goes on to document that a great length uh, using uh, her experience in Los Angeles. So um, I, I do want to step aside. The police departments everywhere uh, are facing great challenges at, at this time, partly as in, in response to the year from hell in, in 2020, uh, and not only the, the with the, 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 the disruption caused by the pandemic, but also the vilification of the police uh, resulting from, from the George Floyd demonstrations and the result of, of a lot of early retirements and difficulty in recruiting and so on and so forth. So what we see around the country is um, a problem in restoring police departments to uh, full force just at the time when we need that, especially as, as the gun violence rates uh, increase, and, and we also need strong leadership to restore the morale to the police and, and uh, to provide the leadership that's necessary. I think Durham is very fortunate to have the chief here in that position, and I look forward to your remarks. Thank you. So I am going to keep my, my remarks brief because I know that y'all have some great questions. Um, so first, please thank you for, for um, inviting me in today. Uh, Dr. Cook, thank you for all of your work that you have done and you continue to do around um, you know, gun violence across our country, but specifically here in the city of Durham. So I don't know how many of you have actually had a chance to read um, the the really great report um, that was uh, done um, just recently. So gun violence from 2017 to 2021. Um, yes, we knew that in order to be able to get a handle on, or at least try to see where we've, how far we've come in policing since the last report that Dr. Cook um, had, had compiled, but where do we need to go? right, um, as, as an organization, especially now our staffing. So, you know, we are at a 19% staffing level. We are around 110 officers down. Um, you know, we have, the demand doesn't decrease just because, you know, the d demand doesn't pop up and say, oh, wait a minute, we'll call timeout while you hire folks into these positions. Now, it's up to us to be very innovative, to think, more outside of the box and to really kind of push away from the, the way with that we used to do things, right? Um, and so when, when, um, when Dr. Cook came in and his team came in and compiled this report, so one, we knew that it was going to show that we still weren't doing everything we possibly could do um, as it relates to our non-fatal shootings. Now, I, I, I don't want to take anything away from my team because um, the Durham Police Department is one of the only police departments in the state of North Carolina that has um, nearly a fully functional crime lab. So we have forensics, digital, um, we have latent, latent prints, um, we have crime scene investigators. Um, and so we have a whole, almost a, a, a well-rounded team, except the only thing we don't do is DNA. Um, those things have to be uh, sent off. But for the most part, we have a very experienced team. Our homicide investigators, our officers that investigate violent crimes, extremely experienced team. And, um, but, but we weren't working along the same vein, right? So homicide investigators would obviously go out when there was a homicide. Our violent crimes investigators would go out when there was a violent crime. So for purposes of what we're talking about, think, you know, shootings, non-fatal shootings. And um, we sat down and staff said, let's, let's look at how we can reorganize. So one, we need to be able to, to save, um, save our officers, kind of protect them from burnout, 
keep them from becoming very disconnected emotionally from their work, right? Because once you start, you kind of see the same things over and over again, you come, you become very detached. And, and that's just a sign of, of being burned out. And so we looked at our, our criminal investigations division. We understand that we have a component that has to investigate property crimes. But what we did was we combined our violent crimes unit and our homicide unit. And we divided them into four teams, four very unique teams. And so that helped out for rotation, but it also doubled the number of officers on one particular team that could be responding out to a homicide or a non-fatal shooting. What does that do? Well, um, it, it, it saves them mentally. It allows more time between their on-call times. Um, but it also allows this team to focus on these non-fatal shootings in a way that we've never done it before. So um, being able to have more officers, more investigators that are doing the neighborhood canvassing, we realigned our victim coordinators. So those are our non-sworn um, victims assistant coordinators. And so their, their role is, is a couple of, of things. Is, um, they, are, they are attached to each homicide violent crime team and they are responsible for conducting the appropriate victim resource follow-ups and getting our surviving victims as well as their family members the certain resources that we know that on scene we can't necessarily provide on scene, right? Um, and also providing them an avenue in which they could ask any question. Um, it doesn't matter what the question, right? And then we realized that, okay, so we are, we, are, we are beefing up our staffing as it relates to non-fatals. We are collecting shell casings and, and processing. So we do have, we have the ability to process our own shell casings for um, ballistic leads, so NIBIN leads. Um, basically, many of you might know that a that a single casing from a gun, from a gun, once it's fired, it leaves from the how it's how it's um, struck down that barrel, and and then the barrel groove marks. It leaves a very unique symbol, a, a fingerprint, as you will, and no one is alike. And um, so it's it allows us to be able to determine that okay, so this this shell casing from this gun was also matched with a shell casing from another event that happened either in another jurisdiction, and we've had several of those, or within the same city. We know now that guns do travel, right? They, they, they travel, and they're being used multiple times um, in, in many different crimes. Sometimes our suspects are different, but they're, they're exchanging these firearms. It's like a firearm marketplace, right? Um, and, and so these are the things that, that, that we knew, but now we're able to, to, to actually provide a little bit more support. Our victimization rate is, um, well, the ages, I will say, of our victims, uh, are much younger. So we are, we are seeing more victims with the, you know, that are teenagers, so 14, 15, 13, almost going to be 14. Um, all the way up until, you know, the age 18, 20, 19, 20, and uh, 24 is about the window, but it's being heavily concentrated at a much younger, so I'm, I'm talking high school, junior high age. That's also on the other side of it, the perpetrators, right? So we're finding that, that, that the age demographic or either being a victim or a suspect in are very, very young, very young. And so where did we go off the rails? Where did we, you know, where did our society start? Where did we start getting to where our most innocent are now becoming victims or perpetrating very adult crimes, very violent offenses? Um, and you know, that comes from trauma. That comes from a lot of things that Dr. Cook was, was saying is that, that it just doesn't happen, right? Victimization, crime is, is, a, is, a, is a direct, um, you could correlate directly that crime and criminality has ties to victimization trauma. 
um, children seeing and viewing things they shouldn't have, right? Um, it comes from um, however that person views themselves, how do you, however you view yourself. And what we find is our children are viewing, they are very expendable. They feel that they're expendable. There is no point. There's no purpose. I mean, I can't get to where you are or you are or you are, right? So because who's going to take time for me? And so having said that and, and knowing that that is the, the very tragic reality of it all, um, the, we, we did some shuffling around in our community services division. Um, we put more focus, pulled more officers, collapsed some of the units, and moved them over to, to our uh, PALS unit, who their responsibility basically is, is youth-based services. So PALS athletic leads, we have now a mentoring league where, where now they have to get their homework done, and we help them with their homework. And then we can, so we're, we're able to, to really focus on our children because we know that is where it starts. That is where the crime starts. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in a world where it's just, it's almost a cycle, right? The, the, the crime, the violent crime, and we're seeing generations becoming more and more involved unless there is an interruption there. I now have met, uh, they're now adults, but they were children when I was here before, and maybe we would, we would conduct a case when I was in vice and narcotics, and we would arrest their parents, and I remember them when they were little. So we know it's a cycle, and if not broken or interrupted, they're bound to continue that and continue. So um, placing more emphasis on solving those non-fatals, and yes, we have a lot of people that, victims, that when they get shot, they have nothing to say. They have absolutely nothing to say, or they'll try and send us down a, a different path. Um, and that is where we still work the case, right? Um, a few of our homicides, we didn't have any leads on, but we still work the case. Many of our aggravated assaults, non-fatal shootings, we don't have any leads on, but we still work the case. We know that there is a camera, there is someone that knows something, and so um, you know, we're able to focus a little more of our efforts there and, um, and, and have been able to, to really start seeing um, some good movement on clearing some of our non-fatals. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I know y'all have a lot of questions, but I appreciate the work that's being done in the city of Durham um, and here at Duke University, really focused around gun violence, but preventing gun violence by getting to the root of the problem um, and, and then empowering and helping us to, to, be, uh, to be better stewards of, of solving that problem. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you both so much for those really wonderful um, uh, remarks. I think it set the table for uh, what I'm sure will be a wonderful discussion. I want to hear lots of questions from the audience, um, but I might sneak in one or two uh, of my own first. Um, one, which uh, picks up where you ended, Phil, which is on the, talking about the sort of tension between under and over policing and the sort of what feels to me like in some respects the central tension in a lot of these discussions right now, which is like navigating between this sort of skill and charybdis of under and over policing the same communities that are suffering the harms that you listed in terms of gun violence are also suffering from over-policing and some mm -hmm. cost of carceralization and what that does to communities. I wonder for you, Phil, what are the, are there particular policies or interventions like ceasefire or community violence intervention that, that's, that, that best navigate that, that provide the public safety benefits of policing without, um, I don't know, exaggerating the, the harms of over-policing? And, and Chief Andrews, you were speaking about this a little bit with community services, athletic leagues, et cetera. Like, how, how does that look from where you sit and how much of it feels like policing as opposed to being asked to do things that maybe um, someone else should do? So Phil, uh, in decades of research, what are the things that best strike the balance between under and over policing? Well, of course, um, I'm very confident in the importance of solving crimes. And uh, I think that 
One thing you can say about that is that it's a very precise uh, intervention, so that it's not going into an entire neighborhood um, and concentrating force there. It is actually an effort to determine who the shooter is and, and to make sure that they're brought to justice. So I think that the, the, the overall theme, and we try to do this in the book, is that it's important to be proactive in some cases. It's certainly important to react effectively. But in both cases, that it's important also to think about the costs and, and to be as precise as possible. And you know, one of the things that criminologists take great pride of in is uh, the observation that crime is concentrated in hot spots, which they see as narrowly defined geographic areas. Uh, and the uh, push there has been to make sure that the, the, they understand exactly where the problem is, that it not spread too widely uh, beyond that. Uh, and furthermore, that in understanding that, that they reach not only uh, for maybe more aggressive tactics in those areas, but also to look at this as a problem-solving opportunity. Uh, and that might include everything up to and including recommendations that we really need to clean up that vacant lot. It's an endless source of problem. We have to do something about that street corner where there's a lot of drug dealing going. I mean, so, and, and then to work with other agencies along the way. So in that vein, the police then become the experts on the ground uh, and are helpful in, in solving these problems and, and avoiding the over-policing charge. Yeah, I, I think that's great. You know, over-policing, that is the result of unchecked behavior. And, and it's also a result of, you know, we're starting out meaning well, but, you know, we, we have a goal and that's to, that's to reduce the crime. And, and then it was the by any means necessary, right? Um, and, and it's trying to get to the goal of lowering the, the crime rate. It doesn't always uh, bode out to such a um, uh, such good behavior. So one, I would say for us, it's understanding that crime you can you can put as many police officers as you want into a community. It's not solving the crime, right? What it's doing is it's restraining a community. It's putting a chokehold, so to speak, on a community. Um, but when you leave. The crime is going to continue because you've not provided the community with really what the access and what they, they actually need in order to be able to heal. Um, and so we, we, recognize, uh, we recognize that that reduction in crime can be done without the over-policing component to it, can be done without the stop and, and frisk. And so we are doing a lot of work. As a matter of fact, um, we started the conversations and we'll be doing an implementation, a pilot implementation around risk terrain modeling. And it's looking at, you know, the location versus the person and bringing departments together across the city of Durham. So, for example, if we're talking about there is... Um, you know, think of crime and uh, crime uh, septed. So it's you know it's it's the crime prevention through environmental design. But you think of it on another scale of if you have a concentrated area of crime, what is that crime that's happening, and what what are the environmental factors around it? So do we have a house that is that is vacant, that is dilapidated, that's being used for criminal activity? How do we keep that criminal activity from happening? Because even if you arrest the person, that does not solve what's drawing the individual there, right? And so we are, we're still going to be doing enforcement. Um, we're not stopping enforcement, but we're, we're also shifting the way in which we solve, um, solve that particular ill of that, of that area. And we're really relying heavily on our different partners within the city of Durham, whether it be with code or neighborhood improvement services, our heart team. So, you know, I absolutely love the work um, that Director Smith and his team are doing around mental health. 
So that is also involved in this. What is the mental health um, component that we need to be looking at for the neighbors that live in that area? So it's all going to go into um, hopefully reducing the crime. I'm going to sneak in one more follow-up question, um, <clears throat> which I will try to pull together two threads in your work, Phil, over the years. So one is that within the category of gun homicides, some get outsized attention. Uh, mass shootings being a good example that account for a very small percentage of gun deaths in any given year, less than a percent, but get enormous attention, and maybe rightly so, because, as you show in also in your work, the impact of a gun homicide goes beyond just the number of victims. And so maybe a mass shooting deters people from engaging in public life, and that has a knock-on effect. So, so one category within gun homicides that we haven't talked about and is, is a horrible thing to talk about, but no better time maybe to do than with this panel, are law enforcement-involved shootings, mm -hmm. um, which, according to the book, account for about 1,000 a year, um, which is not to say that they're not all unjustified. Some, you know, very well may be. The majority may very well may be. Um, I guess for you, Phil, what do we know about law enforcement uh, involved shootings? That is, shootings by law enforcement officers on duty. Um, what do we know about what could prevent them? Um, and Chief Andrews, from where you sit, um, uh, what, what, what feels like it, it, it works? How do you respond when something like that happens? Maybe, Phil, you start us broad and then we can zoom in on. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the Officer involved um, killings, homicides, if you will, uh, probably are around 1,200 as of 2021, mostly uh, with uh, their firearms, uh, and mostly justified in a legal sense. Um, uh, obviously, the events that grab the public attention, um, sometimes for weeks at a time, are a particular subset, and, and what we have seen, uh, in fact, over the years is um, that they involve African American victims. That, and um, one way or another, that there has been a video recording of, of the event, which allows it then for everybody to see um, how, how it played out and, and to be suitably horrified by it. But that um, has led to, I think, of some, um, a, a particular perspective on, on that problem that we in the book are trying to change to, to some extent. Uh, even, first of all, only 25% only of the victims are, are, are black people. So uh, there's 75% who are other races. It's not just a problem. Uh, of racism in that sense, if, if that's the way you want to cast it. Uh, there's another framework to understand this, which is to make international comparisons and, and to say, well, how does the U.S. compare with Canada or with Europe or other countries? And the uh, answer is that we are completely off the charts in, in terms of the number of civilians who are being killed by police officers in the U.S. compared with other countries in any kind of uh, rate. So that suggests that it is possible to do better across the board, across the board, and that the goal here should be to find ways to reduce the, the number of officer-involved killings and, and excess violence generally. The immediate evidence that we put into the book that suggests that this is very possible uh, is to just notice the vast disparities among cities and from one department to another and how frequent this is. So we have a comparison between Phoenix and Dallas. Now Phoenix and Dallas, at least looking from here, in terms of um, the composition, the size of the city, the fact that they're way down there in the southwest somewhere. Um, and yet, consistently, Phoenix has five times the the officer-involved killing rate as Dallas does. And so the, what does that suggest is that the leadership in the department, the way it's organized, what the rules are about engagement, all of those things can make um, way more than a trivial difference in the outcomes along the way. And so that the, the goal here then 
reduce the amount of excess violence, reduce particularly the amount of killing across the board, uh, get past this idea, well, this is just somehow a, a problem of racist cops, and instead say, what, are, what do we need here in, in terms of the, the way it is organized, what, what rules should be in place about drawing the weapon, using the weapon, and, and so forth, and how are we going to enforce those? There's a lot more to this story, but I'll hand it over to you. You know, I wish that, you know, we could have a crystal ball and know, you know, what's going to happen in the future. Policing, law enforcement responding to those calls are extremely unpredictable. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. It could go from one very calm to the next there's a use of force or, um, or a shooting. What I will say is this, I think how you equipped your officers makes the world of difference. Um, you know, the Durham Police Department, we are constantly looking at new ways in which to be able to, to just add more tools to the tool chest for our officers when it comes to, you know, recognizing as an officer when, when you, are, you are over your head. So we're talking about kind of accountability and making sure that you know when you've had enough whether an encounter is becoming too, too heated with someone and you know that you are at that point where they, have, they are really making you back mad and you, you just need to step back, right? Um, having those conversations, but also de-escalation, right? I think de-escalation is more than just, is, is more than just anything that we can, we can train on. I, the ability to de-escalate comes from your heart and really, what is your own outlook on police work? You know, what are you here to do? Ultimately, we always want to be caretakers of lives. We don't ever want to take a life. We in Durham are fortunate to have, um, you know, resources that we can call on uh, in, in, in heart. And they have actually been there on several calls with us where I've had officers that actually call for heart to respond to help them kind of de-escalate a situation. And when Hart gets there, they're able to, to do that and then provide services after the fact. So I think that's important is knowing the resources, also recognizing that law enforcement has never been equipped properly to be able to engage with people in, in mental health crisis. We never have. I mean, we've gone to two-week schools and we've learned just very, just at the very top level, but we don't have that further education that we need in order to, to be able to take that situation to a happy resolution for the person that we are serving at that moment, right? And to provide those resources. Um, also, we provide now more resources, mental health resources for our, our officers. Um, at the Durham Police Department, we are making it, um, removing the stigma of saying, I'm not okay. You know, I am not okay. I'm burned out. I can't be in this position anymore. I need help. Um, we have peer support groups within the police department um, that also has access to outside resources. And we've used those several times with our officers. Uh, and I think that that's important too, is officers being able to say that they're not okay, that they do need help. Um, for what's happening with them. I do want to just lift up one particular occasion where um, we had, we were serving an involuntary commitment, um, it was serving, serving involuntary commitment paperwork, and there had just been a couple of days before um, almost the same scenario, but it ended in a fatal shooting in another jurisdiction. And Thinking, just thinking about how this could have ended up had the officers not stopped and said, hey, I wonder if anyone from Hart is working and can they come out and help us negotiate? Can they come out and actually speak to the family members that obtain this involuntary commitment? Can they come out and speak to the neighbor that we're trying to serve? Um, because this neighbor was actually saying, if you, if you all come up here, I'm going to start shooting at all of you. And, you know, this person was barricaded inside their, their home. But our, our heart um, team member was able to really drill down more 
to the point where um, the next day it was determined he was not a danger to himself or others. Um, however, he did need to go and seek uh, assistance and help from an outside resource. And Hart actually went back the next day and he was ready to go. And so that's a success, right? That's a tool. Um, they, are, they are a resource for us that we, we know we have other options. We don't have to go bursting into that door. Uh, and involuntary commitment paperwork does not mean that we have to go and grab that person, right? We do have other avenues. And so, you know, I just, I, I say to you, the officer involved shootings, they can happen at any time. But it's what do we learn from each one of those, whether it's here or across the country, that we can apply those lessons learned. Wonderful. I said we'd leave some time for Q&A. We do have a few minutes at the end uh, if anybody has a question. Otherwise, I have plenty. Professor Levy. Uh, I just wonder what part is. Yeah, so I, I can't tell you the acronym off the top of my head, only, and it's because, probably because I'm almost 50. And <laughs> I just, I, but HART is the Community Safety Department. If you recall, recall, that was formed a little over a year ago, and it's it's based off of the model as an alternative response um, mm -hmm. to law enforcement um, responding to people in crisis. And there's a um, there's three layers of it. We have a co-response model, which pairs a police officer with a clinician, and you have a clinician that solely responds um, to to certain calls, and then you also have someone that's within the 911 center that will triage calls coming into the 911 center and actually be able to have conversations and offer that person and connect them with services. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks both for coming here. I have a question that has to do with the hiring of the officers. So, Professor Cook, you mentioned that uh, a really big issue is that crimes go, or shootings go unsolved. Is, is there any evidence about specifically hiring more homicide detectives or certain types of detectives in those crimes as opposed to you know, just hiring for a broad pool? And Chief Andrews, I have no idea how police hiring works, but that's possible. Um, I, well, I'll just I'll say in a nutshell, we, we can, um, you know, you develop and train an officer to become an investigator. And so there are certain things that we look for in our investigators, certain thought processes when we when we bring them into the unit. Um, I definitely think, though, that there is a component of education of any young investigator that they have to learn before they can be thrust into homicide unit. Um, and they have to be able to think broad um, when they are investigating. So, yes, yeah, so I think that there's things that we can do when we're training them. But as far as getting them in the door, the actual hiring portion of it, there it would be very hard for us to tell whether this officer coming in in two years, would they be a good investigator? So um, I'll ask two really quick questions. One is, I think, more for Bill, which is um, I'm intrigued by this fact that the, you know, if you have a, a crime with a victim, he doesn't feel like they want to testify. So are there technological fixes for that that can make you know the investigation of those kinds of crimes easier given the fact that you might have a break from a witness or a victim who does not feel that they uh, can trust the police or, or actually hold information about the perpetrator. And my question for the chief which is the pool of people that you are competing with is who? Like people that end up graduating from you know, high school or college and say, well I can go to the police force or I can do so, like, what are those people? Who? Are you, what is the pool of talent that you're competing for that you are trying to, uh, uh, you know, get to join the force as opposed to doing something else? Yeah. Um, so, I've been uh, doing some work in Chicago uh, on this, but I'd be very interested to hear the, the chief's take on this. Uh, but you know, what we're told is the, the state's attorney in Cook County uh, will virtually never take a case of a non-fatal shooting unless the victim is willing to testify. And so uh, there is almost a pointlessness to trying to put together a case without the victim. Of course, they can do it in principle. They do it all the time with homicides. Um, but uh, that they think that if it 
comes to a jury or something that the, the jury will want to hear from the victim and if the victim is not available then that's it so it'll be very interesting to see i, I think it has a lot of overlap with uh, the decades-long discussion of domestic violence cases um, and how that got has gotten sorted out o over time the investigators often talk about you know, when we ask them, you know, that they, they make it clear in many cases that they are partly see themselves as working for the victim. Uh, now, the theory is a little different than that, that they're working for the state, they're working for the public along the way. Uh, but if the victim tells them to go to hell, it, it's hard to stay motivated. Uh, and so there's that problem, but there's also a much bigger obstacle, which is just if, if the DA says, you know, bring me the victim as a witness, and they, and they can't do it, then uh, regardless of what else, else they have. So, yeah. so I'll answer the first question about the talent pool for police officers. So at this point, we have our, we, there used to be a time where we had the luxury of being able to pick and choose. Um, however, now, you know, our talent pool, we, we, ha we, obviously we, we take from other agencies. <laughs> Um, we also look at other community colleges, other accredited universities. Um, so, so we, we, and then we go into the neighborhoods and we're being very visible in the, in, within the communities of Durham. It's removing that feeling that why would I even want to be a police officer? Right. And, and so there's, there's a whole broad campaign that we're trying to do to, to really show that a different side of law enforcement by showing a different side of our police officers that you know they are actual people and this is how they got started personally for me i never wanted to be a police officer but it's you know it's kind of what direction i went because i had to at that time have a job right and here i am <laughs> so you know it's telling those stories and it's really looking different looking at our recruiting different so you know giving my business card to someone at Chick-fil-A because I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about having a great work ethic, right? And already being very polite, you know, it's like I've given like five or six of my business cards literally to Chick-fil-A while I'm in line. It's thinking that way, right? If you notice a characteristic in someone, you give them your card and say, you got what it takes to be a police officer. Um, and as far as the, the, the other side of the coin it, with the victimless, so we know that victimless prosecution can work because we see it in our domestic violence cases, right? You have a photograph of injuries, you have certain statements that are, were uttered, uh, uttered spontaneously, and we know, so we know that there is and can be victimless prosecution. And so my direction to our investigators is, don't worry about what the district attorney's office is going to say or do, right? Work that case as if your victim is cooperating with you 100%, right? Because sometimes we can bring enough evidence without the victim to court and say, this is what we have. We have this person. We have their cell phone data. We have all of these things, right? We, we have this person. We have the video. So let's move forward. Um, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes prosecution is declined. Um, but we don't get deterred by that, and we certainly just, that's a part of the house that we work it through until it's time to present. In closing, I'll make two quick recommendations. We've gone over a little bit, um, uh, but uh, for more detail actually on those last two questions and more on Chief Andrews' career arc and vision for Durham, there's a wonderful episode of the Legal Eagle podcast recorded by our good friends at Central Law School, Irv Joyner, and that's right, and alma mater of the Chief, uh, Irv Joyner and uh, April Dawson, uh, a wonderful interview with Chief Andrews. If you want more details on that and for more details on Phil's work, of course, again, please pick up a copy of Police and Gun Violence, Hot Off the Press from Oxford University Press. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.